Hello, and welcome to the next episode of the Anti-Contractor Home Podcast. My name is Chance. And I'm Belinda. In this podcast, we look at different ways of constructing a home in that would be more homeowner friendly, something easy to construct, easy to maintain, easy to renovate, um, something that doesn't rely so heavily on contractors in the long run or even in the construction of it, something that the homeowner can manage and fix on his or her own. Yeah, I'd like to say that we, we take the power away from the contractor and give it to the homeowner. Yeah. That's our goal of this podcast. So in today's podcast, we're going to talk about, we're going to follow up on our insulation series and discuss spray foam insulation. Now, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we we, meant, we talked about uh, fiberglass and mineral wool insulation, and then we spoke about rigid, rigid foam board. Yeah. insulation, and now we're talking about spray foam, which is most commonly the stuff you see on site with the guys in the hazmat suits. In new construction. In yeah. new construction, yes. And it's becoming much more and more popular yeah. in today's higher end homes. It has, uh, prom- it promises a lot of advantages uh, over traditional forms of insulation like fiberglass. Everybody seems to be uh, raving about it, uh, but we're here to see if uh, our discussion today will hopefully uh, debunk some myths and, and maybe we'll give uh, people a better understanding of whether or not it's the right application for you. Yeah. Okay, so at the end of last week's podcast, we talked about polyiso boards, polyiso insulation that's usually used on roofs. It's yes. the foil-faced stuff. And I mentioned that um, the, there's a chemical reaction, there's an exothermic chemical reaction that creates polyiso between MDI, which is methylene diphenyl diisocyanate, and polyester. Um, so what I found really surprising when I was looking into the spray foam insulation is how similar polyurethane insulation is to uh, polyiso insulation. It starts off with the same ingredient, MDI. So poly polyurethane is spray foam. Uh, yes. Insulation. Well, you can you can say polyiso is spray foam, but just done in a factory on a substrate in controlled conditions. It's it's spray foam as well. Okay, so it's the same it's the same method of creating the insulation, but. One is done on site, Site. one is done in a controlled factory. Yes. So the method of creating polyiso is a little more tricky. You have to get the conditions just right. That's why it it comes in board form done by experts in a factory. And then we were saying that was the the greenest of the rigid boards, right? That that creation process, wasn't it? Yes, because it uses pentane as a blowing agent rather than HFCs. But then it can't be recycled. Yes, it can't be recycled. Yeah. But it has a long lifespan, similar to the polyurethane that we're going to talk about today. Okay. So polyurethane is made with the same thing, MDI, but it uses a polyether with MDI rather than a polyester. So it's a little more forgiving. It can be done on site without the perfect hun- ideal conditions. It has lower strength capabilities than a polyiso board. It's not as firm as that as a polyiso and polyiso from what I've seen is always closed cell. Polyurethane which you spray in homes and commercial spaces can either be closed cell or open cell. Okay. Okay. So that's the main differences between the two but today we're going to be talking about polyurethane. Yeah the polyurethane version the one that's done on site. Yes. So um, you can buy two part polyurethane foam at Home Depot or any other big box store but what I've seen is they sell the low pressure polyurethane that's what's used in home renovations but not in new construction so that's a more DIY friendly version it is a more DIY friendly version okay yeah so so it can it's usually used in attic spaces around like mechanical ductwork or uh, sometimes around like electrical not electrical boxes they use one part foam It cannot be used in stud bays. For that, you need to use the high pressure polyurethane. That's what's used in new construction. Mm. So if you're renovating your house and you tear down your drywall, you need to use the high pressure? Yes, then if if you're doing that, yeah. Okay, I don't understand why you need to use the high pressure over the low pressure. I don't know. You would think maybe 
if you're trying to put it around ductwork and stuff, you don't want to damage it. That's why you would use low pressure. But in walls, you're just spraying if it on a substrate. Then you would use high pressure. If that pressure ap- applies to how, how, how yeah. uh, the pressure it's sprayed out at. Yeah. And not the structural integrity of it or what it is. Yeah. So the stuff you buy, this uh, low pressure stuff you buy at Home Depot, is that the stuff that you get in the can? It's not. That That's a one part foam. Okay. So the, the two part is two different canisters and those are mixing and those spray out this uh, low pressure polyurethane. Yes. Whereas so in the, a can, it's already pre-mixed or partly mixed. Okay. So, so when you press that button, like the top uh, valve or something, it opens up and I think a blowing agent is added to the already mixed chemical and that creates a foam. And that you only, I think that has more use in terms of like preventing rodents or something coming through holes. Okay. So that's that's more, that's like the extreme DIY version yes. where you're just, you're just patching up a hole or something. Yes. You're I know. Not, not trying to get any R value out of that. I remember when I lived in a, a basement apartment in Cincinnati. Oh, I had this yeah. huge, uh, maybe it was a six by six hole in my the ceiling of my shower. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I just left it as is. And then I finally decided, hey, maybe I'll get something to fill that up. So I did use this one part spray foam and filled that hole up. And that was messy. <laughs> Man. It fell while you were spraying? Yeah. Yeah. Some fell uh, because spraying a hole that there, there was I mean in Nothing. what little I knew I should have just gotten some drywall and patched it yeah. up right <laughs> okay so in discussing uh polyurethane two-part spray foam insulation let's get, do, do, do. get really specific yes. there is within that there are two different si- types uh, open cell and closed cell like we discussed last week same exact properties when it comes to open cell versus closed cell mm-hmm. uh, it's the loss of air and gas is seeping out of the open cell yeah. versus the closed cell is holding that in Correct. for its uh, lifespan. So closed cell is more dense and it has all the properties you would expect of an insulation that's more dense. It's going to have a higher R value. Uh, this foam insulation in particular uh, serves as an excellent moisture or air barrier. Uh, it resists water. Um, it has an R value of about six to seven per inch. Yeah. And uh, it, it does a better job than an open cell of absorbing sound, even though open cell has these properties and it, it, it um, but, outdoes. But we spray less of it. So you would think that would be a better sound absorber than open cell? Well, I think we're talking inch per inch. Inch per inch. Yeah. Because, yeah, yeah if you spray more of open cell, you have the same R value as less That's of closed true. cell. But then there's also the cost difference. Closed cell is going to, since it's more dense, more material, it's going to cost more. Yes. I think twice the price. Yes. And closed cell is used in, most commonly used in commercial applications, correct? Yes, it is. And then within that, there's a couple of different types yeah. of closed cell. There's both high density and low, and or medium sorry, density. medium density. So in commercial applications on the roof, they use high density closed cell polyurethane. And... That does not expand as much as the name suggests. It's really dense. So it they say it creates some sort of like a structural support for your roof to prevent uplift in case okay. of high winds. So it's so dense that it actually has some weight and it creates this monolithic structure yeah. in your roof. Yeah. But in the walls of these commercial spaces, they use medium density stuff. There's no real need to use high density. But still closed cell. But still closed cell. Okay. Yes. And is that that's is that because closed cell and commercial buildings they want them to last as long as possible as low maintenance as possible heck a commercial building could be seen as a good example of an anti-contractor home right yeah that's true i mean built of steel uh-huh. uh doesn't move uh simple it's, construction it's never just slab on great too it's always some right. peers because yeah. they don't want to do foundation work down the line they yeah. want it to be strong sturdy stable they're going to use a closed cell because it's going to last longer. It doesn't have the thermal drift that something like open cell would have. Correct. And it's... it's so it doesn't compress over time or lose right. its R value. It's, yeah. It's done once and... But open cell doesn't lose its R value either. Oh, so open cell's thermal drift is the same as closed cell? Yeah, but it has a lower R value. You need, you need twice the amount of thickness with open cell to get the same R value as closed cell. Okay. Okay. So, with commercial spaces, they have more money to spend. They're just going to go 
for the best available uh, products out there. Right. So because mm-hmm. they want the the lowest maintenance possible. Yes. Yeah. So, so open cell. Yeah. That's what's used in residential. Most commonly homes. used in residential. Yeah. It's possible to use it, use closed cell, but it's going to be like we said, it's much more expensive. It's really, it seems like it's overkill almost. Yeah. I mean, heck, spray foam in itself could be seen, <laughs> seen as, overkill, as overkill. Yeah. Uh, because we've been fine with blanket insulation for so long. Yeah. But uh, now it's it's where the trend is going. Yeah. But open cell is not as, um, it's less dense than closed cell. So it still has all the advantages of being a moisture barrier, air barrier. Um, it's uh, half the price of closed cell. So yes. it's. 50 but cents per square foot per inch rather than dollar. But half the R value. But half the R value. Yeah. So it's around 3.5 rather than R7. Six to seven, yeah. yeah. Six to seven. Yeah. So it's more commonly used in residential because it's the cheaper option. Yeah. It's the more, uh, I'm not going to say DIY friendly, but user friendly. Uh, because if you do screw up and overspray, you, you can, can just cut it. it yeah, slice easily. it off. <laughs> yeah. So this has a low thermal drift. So maybe I was wrong. It has a little bit of thermal drift compared to closed cell. But okay. it's, it's just really low compared to fiberglass insulation or anything else we've talked about. Right, yeah. yeah. I'd be interested to see the numbers on yeah, the thermal drift thermal because drift. it's probably so low it's insignificant yeah. over the lifespan of the building. So the thing, we made a mistake last week when we were talking about open cell. We said when we're cutting open cell, is it releasing all these hydrofluorocarbons into the air? What's caught in... Yeah, uh, it's like off gassing. But it's not. Oh. So open cell uses carbon dioxide as a blowing agent. So they say it's more environmentally friendly than closed cell insulation. Because closed cell uses HFCs or hydrofluorocarbons. You know, I read that it's still legal to use that in the States. They're gonna ban it by January twenty twenty one. CFCs are banned, chlorofluorocarbons, okay. but HFCs which still cause ozone layer depletion. That will only be banned next year. Okay. And so they have trying to come out with an alternative that's just as good for closed cell insulation before then. Okay. So you won't be able to get HF, uh, closed cell insulation? You'll be able to get it, but they, they're coming up with another blowing agent. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Something more environmental. The next friendly. thing to be banned. The, yeah. So now let's discuss two part polyurethane open cell, could be closed cell, but open cell spray foam insulation. Yeah. that's in residential applications. So it has the highest potential R value of any of the insulation methods we dis- discussed. Per, per square foot per inch. Okay. but If I, it's done right. It's it's weird to think about that because it's an R3.5 per inch, right? Isn't XPS like an R5 per inch? Yeah. But the problem with that is that if you put rigid board XPS in your stud base, you still have to seal around it in order to get that the same perfect it's not gonna be a perfect yeah, fit the yeah. same uh, ceiling you would get with a spray foam yeah that expands mm-hmm. so that's probably that's why it has the highest potential r value yeah another advantage i saw was that it stops all three forms of heat transfer which is what we talked about two weeks ago conduction convection and radiant heat so conduction is the loss or gain of heat through the actual material itself through mm-hmm. this through a solid and since spray foam has very little material it's mainly air like it expands up to 60 60 times mm-hmm. um, the actual material um, it has very loose molecular bonds and it's mainly air so there's not much conduction going on through that okay convection then, wouldn't that mean it's yeah so i, I was just thinking yeah. well then wouldn't that mean it would have a high convection uh, heat transfer, but it doesn't because it's, it's trapped air. It's, it's airtight. not airtight. Yes. Yeah. It's not, there's no flow of air. Right. Because it's, it's creating a barrier. Right. It's an air barrier. Yeah. yeah. This can serve as your air barrier. Yeah. So it's, the it's, air molecules don't count as the convection. That's interesting because like if you cut it, it's not like it's just this thin film of yeah. material. You mm-hmm. cut it, it's still there. It's it kind of. pretty solid. Yeah. It's, yeah. but it expands up to 60 times its original size. That's. Yeah. It's like uh, mm. candy, right? Like the cotton candy. It has, you need so mm. little sugar. I thought that was fiberglass insulation. <laughs> but you get so much out of that. But it seems like it's a lot of material, mm. but it's just few granules of sugar. It's the same, same idea. Same idea. 
Yeah. Okay. I haven't watched the cotton candy process too much. Oh, you haven't? You've not seen it at Fez? I've seen it, but I don't I don't think about it in terms of how it relates to spray foam insulation. Oh, okay. <laughs> More fiberglass insulation with that. Okay. And then the third form of heat transfer is radiant heat. So this is pretty silly, I think, but they say that if since spray foam is opaque and not transparent, it's not glass, that means it stops radiant heat. Yeah. I mean any a wall would stop radiant heat. Anything other than glass would be stopping radiant heat. So I think that's pretty silly. Really? Any form of insulation, fiberglass, mineral wool, that's all opaque. Mm. All I, thought that you, I thought you had to have that foil phase for it to stop radiant heat. No, I think radiant heat is just through windows, something transparent. Because it's electromagnetic it's the sun's waves, right? the energy. Yeah. The, sun, the heat from the sun. Hmm. Yeah. But if the heat, like... But if it if that Im- electromagnetic waves hit your surface and heats it up, then it's conduction. That's true. That's no longer. It, it heats up the exterior and it transfers through. That process of it transferring through conduction. is conduction. That's not yeah. direct radiant heat. Right. If it's through so glass, then it's direct. Radiant it could heat. be sort of a, a version of radiant heat because it's that's how it starts. But isn't that how all not all heat, but that's how a lot of heat is? Yeah. Starts as radiant heat. Yeah. And then turns into conduct convection or conduction, but the only yeah, because you can say that radiant heat heats up air, heat, and that causes wind, right. which leads to convection. Yeah, but yeah. the only form of direct radiant heat is through, through your, your windows. windows. Yeah. Let's go to the disadvantages now because I have a lot of. Okay, to say it seems about like this. we have more disadvantages than advantages. Yeah, I'm not convinced but, with this stuff. But everybody rants and raves about I it. I know. So what's um, what's so bad about this stuff? There's so many things. One of them is that. It's a chemical reaction. The You're two asking, part, yeah. yeah, it's two part uh, spray foam. You're asking people who aren't chemists to be chemists on site under if it's conditions that cannot be controlled. Like, what kind of training do you need to do to be a spray foam insulator? Uh, I'm sure they go through a few courses. Yeah, probably. But you have to get the temperature just right. The the way you spray it is very important too. And the surface needs to be nice and clean. Yep. Which is not and it has so to be easy to do e- on a job site. Yeah. And it has to be a really even coat. Mm-hmm. When you see there are lots of people that sprayed with like lumps here and there. That means it's not sprayed properly. The thickness is very... There's, it, there's so much that can go wrong. There's a, It's almost like there's an art to applying it. Yeah. To installing it. Yeah. You, and you need to be an expert. It's and that's that's like every product fails if install, installed incorrectly. But but there's also the human error. When it's done in a factory made, by, made on a board, mm-hmm. it's done by machines in controlled conditions. Mm-hmm. Here it's done by a human. And humans are not perfect. Right. Not saying machines, but I'm saying that there's so much that can go wrong since it's a human doing it. Okay, so, but so many people use it and it's, yeah. it's, people rant and rave about it. It's not. They rant and raved about EFIS as well. That's true. Back in the 80s. Yeah, is it just such a new technology that people don't understand the, the negatives? Maybe. Or maybe we're just too cynical about maybe it Maybe right it's now. too cynical, yeah. There's a lot of unknowns about this. Yeah. Uh, it being a new product, it, you need a, a professional on site to install this properly. Uh, there's the issue of off gassing, which yes. I've heard uh, back Horror and forth. Horror stories about. Yeah, I mean, like some people will say, "Oh no, it's going to off gas in 20 years. Just wait." And then others say, "Hey, my house is fine. It has never off gassed. I'm, I'm okay." Yeah, but but you don't, you can't always detect those chemicals that are being off gassed. Some of them you can smell. Some can just be in your air, and you won't even know. That's dangerous. Mm-hmm. Like when you buy a board at a factory that's completely off gas to polyiso board before it's brought to your site. Mm-hmm. Here the, there's a chemical reaction taking place and it's on site. On site. And they say yeah. don't enter your house for at least 24 hours after this is sprayed, but it can continue to off gas even after that if it's not done right. Mm-hmm. Then the other thing is the use of HFCs in closed cell spray foam insulation, which is really bad for the environment. And I said, earlier that it's going to be banned in 2021 but people are still using that until then another interesting thing i saw is that 
um, building standards, building code has been, it changes every year. Absolutely. So in the northern states, they require both cavity insulation and continuous insulation. And it's only a matter of time before they bring those same laws to the southern states as well. Why do you think that? Because it wasn't in the northern states for years ago, they ch- they're slowly going to change it. Oh, okay. Be- people are realizing the advantages of having continuous insulation on the outside. On the exterior of your home. Yeah. Mm-hmm. To prevent any uh, thermal bridging. Yes. So even when you spray the spray foam between your studs, those studs are still going to be exposed to the outside. Those can still right. conduct. Yeah. So your R value, this mm-hmm. excellent R value that you're getting is not continuous all the way around. Correct. You're still losing yeah and if it's not sprayed properly if there are gaps then it's just as just the same as using mineral wool over there or or bat or any other Mm -hmm. rigid board it has to be properly sprayed on studs as well Mm -hmm. and lots of times especially in the northern states people will use a rigid board on their exterior and a spray foam on the interior but that's by that's by code the code says you need cavity insulation, which can be spray foam, and you need continuous insulation either on the inside or the outside. Right. But I would think lots of people do would think that that would be overkill to use spray foam on the interior. Yeah. Along with rigid board. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, they could use fiberglass or something else. Yeah, yeah. But it's becoming more and more popular. Like it seems like the northern states are just trying to see how high they can get that R value. Yeah. I don't wonder why. Why do they need it to be so well sealed and warm? Why? I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I think one one of the scariest things about uh, spray foam insulation is the inability to detect leaks. Oh. Because both in your mm-hmm. roof and your walls, you have this moisture and air barrier that is completely sealing sealing the interior of your building and if your exterior uh, water resistant barrier is not if there's a failure in the installation or if you have a leak at some point that water is going to uh, come in and hit your spray foam and it'll stop at your spray foam it has nowhere to go after that right but it's just going to sit there yeah and then you have rot building up, you have mold, yeah, um, and you know nothing about it because you can't see on it. the interior. Yeah. yeah, you're still fine. So that your house will sort of deteriorate from the inside out. From the outside in? No, inside of your walls out. Ah, got it. Let's say you have fiberglass insulation. You don't have that air barrier that is so tight that your house can't breathe so you get let's say you have a roof leak as opposed to the wood the water settling there and rotting out your wood it will since your house can breathe it will dry out over time but we're it sounds like we're leaning towards exterior rigid board insulation and when you do that your house is not going to breathe you're preventing your house from breathing you're preventing any moisture from coming in so why is it bad that your house doesn't breathe? Like there's a really interesting Matt Rizinger video. Um, and he talks about this breathability of homes. And he says it's a very old concept having a house that breathes. Nowadays, with this high R value, triple glazed windows, we don't need breathable homes. We need homes that prevent air or moisture from even coming in. Yes. I think what I'm trying to say is that uh, if moisture breathable d- homes were sort of the trend for so long. Uh, that's how houses have been built forever um, or for hundreds of years. So this but is now like a this, halfway point. There's it's a move towards this airtight yeah. building envelope, which is great in theory. But if there's a failure in installation at any point, hmm. you're potentially uh, or you're causing a potential for a much bigger problem down the road. I see what you mean. Okay. It's not that yeah. airtight buildings are bad because... In theory, if everything's installed perfectly, you it is much better. Yeah. You'll never have a leak or anything. Yeah. But we've, we've sort of had this margin for error in the past for construction workers. And I'm of the opinion that that margin of error needs to be there because yeah. 
we've been on plenty of construction sites and yeah. it's sloppy. Yeah. It, it, and that's the best you can ask for. Unless you're physically doing everything yourself, you're stapling in every little piece of but house even, wrap even and yourself. you're not over stapling anything. Yeah. Um, and you're applying the tape properly. There's going to be mistakes. Yeah. It's the, it goes back to the margin of error. Mm-hmm. There's very high margin of error when it comes to spray foam insulation that uh, could backfire. And yeah. it has already backfired. There are lots of cases that you where people have had to rip out the entire roof because the chemicals or the spray foam that was on their roof, on the underside of their roof, wouldn't stop off gassing. Yeah, I think that that's one thing that I wanted to mention about the disadvantage is that any any issues you have, let's say you do have a leak or something and you need to repair that area, the, the spray foam is very disruptive to yeah. your building. And It's um, not a simple, hey, roll up this bat insulation, uh, yeah. throw it away, put a new one up. You have to If it's it applied down. to your sheathing or something, you have to cut out your yeah. sheathing because that stuff's not coming off. Yeah. So that's definitely not anti-contractor friendly. Right. In the sense in, that... Of maintenance or... Yeah. It, I mean, I, I feel like well. spray foam in itself is not anti-contractor home friendly because it's difficult to install. Um, it does have the advantage of being low maintenance if installed perfectly. If insta- yeah. Um, but as far as renovations and things like that, it's it's very difficult to deal yeah. with. Uh, one of the other disadvantages I wanted to mention about spray foam was, uh, let's say you you apply your spray foam uh, and your house continues to settle. Your wood continues to oh. um, warp and bend over time. Uh, maybe the wood is not fully dried out. Hmm. Um, and so over time you have the shifting and settling of your house. Well, that's going to cause the spray foam to peel away from the studs. And there you have an air gap, another potential for a leak. That's true. Or air penetration, you're losing your R value. Yeah. So what about exterior rigid board when it comes to your house settling? You're wrapping your entire house in this um, jacket. And if it does move, is your outside, your exterior board going to crack too? Yeah. Well, the joint is a lap joint. Uh, so it may pull away at that lap joint, but hopefully you have that joint taped as well, which the tape could fail. But <laughs> then you have a house wrap on top of that yeah. to where you're you're at least preventing moisture from, from coming, coming in. in. Yeah. So you're saying that a, a lapped joint has more give than a foam that has been sprayed on your studs or anything. It could peel away I, more I believe than so, yeah. joint. Hmm. Yeah. So spray foam as an anti-contractor home practice it does not seem like the optimal method, in no. our opinion. We feel that it is it is not DIY friendly. Yeah. Um, the stuff you can get at Home Depot is not the proper. Uh, it's not the proper material. It's not the proper form of spray foam to use in a new construction application. And also the, the cost too. How, is it really the best or most cost effective method? to insulate your home. Yeah, the, to, to be fair, fiberglass insulation is the cheapest there is. Yeah, and you can get an R30 fiberglass. R, right, you that's can what get you pretty good get R for your, your roof. Yeah. yeah. But you don't have that sealing, sealing air barrier, yeah. moisture barrier effect that you do have with rigid board or spray foam insulation. Yeah. But I'd rather get that sealing effect from an exterior wrap, an exterior rigid board wrap or a sips or something like that a zip system a zip system or your, a tie bag yeah something that you can apply that, that that's its sole job mm-hmm. is to do that rather than get it on the inside of your home mm-hmm. i think i think you, you have to um decide which side of the fence you are uh on when it comes to uh, different types of insulation and whether you want your house house to breathe or not because let's face it the the rigid board and the spray foam is creating a an airtight home. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I think you have to realize that rigid board and spray foam are much more expensive than fiberglass insulation. Yes. And so you assess your cost up front. Do I want to pay more up front for an airtight building? Mm-hmm. Or do I want to pay significantly less up front using fiberglass insulation? And then, and then pay more... 
pay a pay more a for a high highly efficient HVAC unit. Yeah. And control your home that way. Yeah. Yeah. And another con- uh, concern of ours in our anti-contractor home is flexibility. Either moving walls around or with the outlets or anything. If something has to be changed, it can be easily ac- accessed, easily moved around. And when you have all these stud base sprayed with f- spray foam or even your attic space, it's set in place. There's no room yeah, for flexibility there. Yeah, that's true. With, with fiberglass insulation, you can open up your wall and you can move and just move that fiberglass around. Yeah. Now you're you're losing the rated R value of that, but it's not. It's much easier to work with. Yeah. yeah as long as you're wearing gloves or something. Yeah. Uh, so what but, else? So what what's your favorite type of these these three different types we mentioned? We we talked about the the blanket insulation, the rigid board, and the spray foam. Um. I'm I'm really interested in a combination of mineral wool. And poly ISO on the outside. Mineral wool in your between stud your studs base? and okay. poly ISO on the outside. Okay, yeah, I like the. I'm a fan of the idea of wrapping the exterior of your house. Yeah, I think uh, removing all those potential thermal bridges, uh, just cutting that out of the equation, can drastically help in the ceiling of your building. Mm-hmm. Make it more airtight, improve your R value, things like that. Okay, so that's all we have for our uh, insulation podcast series. I think we're going to wrap it up here. And next week, we'll talk about air moisture and vapor barriers that are applied to the outside of the house over the insulation. Stay tuned for that podcast. And until then, I'm Belinda. And I'm Chance. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.